Okay, let's take a look again at our Wine data set. I loaded and um, so you see here that um, we have observations starting from the year 1981 to 1988 for which we don't have any data or of the price index in the auction prices. And this data has not been used uh, to estimate our model and hopefully it has also not been used to uh, determine, for example, the functional form of our model. But we have also weather variables for those data points. So in principle, we can use our model to make prediction about the price index for those years. And uh, let's do this. So um, let's first separate our data into the data set we use for our estimation and in the data set we use uh, uh, to kind of have, make some out of sample prediction. And uh, I use the uh, labels already, which we learn in the next chapter, in the machine learning chapter. So I call the data set we use for um, the estimation train uh, for the training data set. And um, so these shall be all, um, sorry, all the observations um, of that, uh, where the vintage is uh, smaller equal to 1980. And there were also two um, years for which we hadn't any price data. So I add this NA omit. I use this pipe command. And then our training data has 27 observations. Um, uh, the vintage from 1952 uh, to uh, 1980, where two are missing because, uh, or like 94 is missing, uh, 1954 is missing because where we didn't have any price data. And uh, the data set for which you want to make out of sample predictions shall be called test, shall be our test data set, and that shall contain all the uh, vintages um, uh, from 1981 or larger. Actually, um, if you look at it, we, we are still missing one column, the age. So we want to have the age in our estimation and also use it later for prediction. So before we separate this data set that generates this column age, I just say that um, dollar sign age shall be equal to 1990. That's the year where the auctions take place minus the vintage. And then I run this data points again. So we have now for every observation in the training and test data set also uh, column age. Then we run our um, estimation and I store the, the result in the variable a rec and we want to estimate a uh, linear model uh, with the logarithm of the price as dependent variable and explanatory var variables where the temperature plus the harvest rain plus the winter rain uh, plus the age and I could try to run it and I get an error object price not found so I made a, a typical mistake. I forgot to add the data object. Uh, the relevant data object shall be the training data here. Okay. I want to estimate my model only on the training data. So now I want to use this estimated model to predict the price in our, or the logarithm of the price in our test data set. And for this, I can use the function predict which you can apply on most uh, estimated model, be it linear models, or later we learn about regression trees or random forests. And the first argument is our estimated model, so this would be REC. And the second argument is the data set for which you want to do the prediction, and this would be our test data set. And if I run this line, I get now basically for every observation in the test data set a uh, predicted price. Maybe we can store this result in the column, uh, um, log price head, so the head shall say it's an estimate. And I can take a look now at our test data set. So we have for every um, vintage a prediction of the uh, log price. And it was calculated basically just in this way. If I look at uh, my model uh, rec, um, I, I, I basically just computed um, like, um, this intercept um, minus seven point seven oh seven times um, uh, test sorry plus zero point six one six times test temp uh, plus uh, here this coefficient minus zero point oh oh 
3861 times test harvest rain plus this coefficient times test winter rain plus this coefficient times test age and um, and this is our are these predicted prices and so here I have round a little bit the, the intercept and the coefficient in front of the temperature so they are not exactly the same but that's the way how I have made this prediction so I just basically computed the prediction of my linear model using the estimated coefficients and setting the residual equal to zero now ideally in a machine learning uh, approach we would have a test data set for which we also know the values of the dependent variables, so for which we know the prices and then could compute the log prices and then we would compare the predicted log prices with the actual log of the prices and can look at the difference or the squared difference and get stuff like root mean squared estimation error that we will look at in the next chapter. Unfortunately, I could nowhere find value data for the price index for those vintages. So we cannot do this here. So we cannot really formally assess the out of sample prediction accuracy on our test data set. If you recall this YouTube video from the TV documentary, you, you, you will hear that Aschenfelder argues that the vintage of 1986 may be a good test candidate because uh, the, the critics, wine critics, seem to have said that this will be a very good vintage. But actually, the prediction from the model is uh, fairly bad. Uh, let's maybe look at this uh, in our data set that the prediction for the 1986 vintage is, is relatively bad compared to all the other wine models. To do this, uh, let's basically um, make a prediction of the uh, uh, log price for our whole data set, so including the training and the test observations. So we predict. Um, for the whole data set, um, the log prices. So we have now in our complete data set, for every observation, a predicted price, even for those where the actual price was missing. And um, we can rank now all the vintages. So let's say that um, it's called price rank. And I say it's the rank of the uh, predicted price for every vintage. And uh, there's this function rank, so typically it ranks from small to big. If I want to rank from big to small, I take a minus here. Uh, so here I have to add dot dollar log price hat. And then if I look at it, I basically have the, the price rank for all the vintages. So the most expensive vintage price rank one is the vintage of 1961. So that's this great famous vintage. Uh, which actually had the highest price, but for which we also predicted the highest price. And now we can take a look at this uh, vintage from 1986, which Aschenfelder pointed out in this video. And we see that here it's predicted actually very poorly in the price rank. So we have a 37 observation and it's ranked at the position 34. So Aschenfelder's formula would actually say that this is a very um, bad vintage. Uh, um, but uh, the people who, who tried this wine uh, at the harvest, they said, oh, it tastes very good. It will become a good vintage. So this is at least one observation. It's not much. Uh, but we can check out uh, the uh, qualitatively for these observations, how well it performed in the end, what prices we found. So unfortunately, I couldn't find any hard price data for this vintage, but uh, there are these wine web pages where we can find some qualitative assessment. So like here from the Wine Cellar Insider, they write, critics at the time were enamored with the 1986 Bordeaux wine, so they really loved it uh, when they first tasted them. But time has not been kind to most of 1986 Bordeaux wine. The fruit has fled over the past few decades, and with few exceptions, only the brutal hard tenor tenants remain. That, uh, so this sounds as if Aschenfelder was right. So at least this comment said is uh, it, it didn't perform so well as the critics uh, expected. So this seems to be in line with our formula, who also said it's a bad vintage. However, if we continue reading it, um, um, old that has fans of what is known as the traditional Bordeaux enjoy. So some people still seem to like it. Here's another description uh, in German. Uh, uh, 
and they actually write that the um, the prices of the wines from 1986, uh, meanwhile, have reached a very high level. Um, so uh, they say it's relatively high, but they also say uh, relative to the high en primeur prices, en primeur are the prices directly after the harvest, this is uh, relative. So prices are high, but the initial prices were, were much more higher, so it's not clear uh, whether it's... Um, a good or bad wine, but 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 this argues that the prices are relatively high. So um, in the end, the reviews are a little bit mixed. It seems to be the case that the uh, critics were not right that it's really a great vintage, but it also seems not to be correct that Aschenfelder's formula was right by saying uh, that this is a really bad vintage. So it seems to be somewhere in between the truth. But in the end, it's really a pity that uh, I couldn't find any. Um, hard data for the price indices so uh, so that I really could uh, evaluate quantitatively the out of sample prediction of Aschenfelder's wine model. So interesting, so Aschenfelder wrote another article in 2008 where he repeated this analysis and discussed some new data, um, but also there he didn't perform such a quantitative assessment of the out of sample prediction accuracy. So you would have thought that maybe then he collected the price data for the later vintages from 1981 going on, but at least I didn't find this in this paper and also didn't find any data set for this. Um, so it could be that it's just relatively difficult to collect this data and maybe it's also hard because the original price index was on auctions from 1990, but you basically had to use auctions for later um, years to assess later vintages, so that may have been problematic. But it could also be that maybe there were not so high incentives to do this. Maybe somebody, or Aschenfeld or so, already suspected that maybe out of sample prediction performance is not so good and so he didn't collect the data. I don't know actually. So he discusses in this uh, 2008 paper some other um, uh, predictions, like for vintage of 2000-2003, but interestingly he also doesn't discuss this vintage of 1986 anymore. Even so, this was basically the vintage he stated in this video, which would be a good test of his model. And giving the previous results, so it doesn't seem to have extremely low prices. So maybe that the model didn't perform so super well. So, um, some comments from my side. So looking at this in-sample fit, this kind of very simple model where you only have four explanatory variables seems to look actually very nice and intuitive to, to predict the quality of young vines. And it's really not often the case that if you ha have an economic model with so few variables that you can so well kind of predict uh, a dependent variable. However, what is really missing basically to be convinced that it's really a good model is a systematic assessment of the out of sample prediction accuracy. Uh, maybe there was one, but I just didn't find it. Um, so in this sense, it's still kind of hard to assess the quality of the model. And modern machine learning uh, really requires a step. So you really have to make, show that your model is good uh, uh, for out of sample prediction accuracy. We will later see that a lot of economic models who really focus on estimating some causal effect don't make this requirement, but that's just because you cannot really assess out of sample prediction accuracy. But this we will discuss later. But actually here for this wine model, one could actually in principle do it um, if one can collect price data, but it has not been done. So this is kind of a thing, I guess, missing from the analysis. Anyway, so that was our first chapter. And uh, it's time for you to solve the Artuto problem set. And then we can move on to the second chapter. Bye.